I think that we make a common mistake in software development circles of dismissing the unicorns. I suppose that we often make the mistake of too slavishly following them too, uh, but that's probably the topic for a different episode one day. I can't tell you how many times people have told me, don't mention Google or Amazon or Facebook, we aren't them. I can understand that, but I also think it's a little bit of a risky strategy to ignore the lessons of successful companies. We can learn from them. Sure, there are things that make the problems these web monsters face unique, but there are also lessons that we can take away and they grew to this state because they were doing some things right. So today I'm interested in what we can learn from how Amazon develops software. Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery. Welcome to my channel. If you haven't been here before, please do hit subscribe. And if you enjoy the content today, hit like as well. Amazon are one of the most successful companies in the world and produce software at a staggering pace. These days, Amazon deploy change into production more than 136,000 times per day. That's more than 1.5 times per second. But it wasn't always like that. Amazon began with a fairly conventional relational database-backed system written in C++. They grew very quickly, so quickly in fact, that for many years, their technology was the main constraint on the growth of the company. I remember sitting in the audience at an internal presentation by Amazon's CTO, Werner Virgos. He was describing the challenges of web scale computing. This was not long after the famous Jeff Bezos email that introduced small two pizza teams and what became the distributed service model that was the genesis of Amazon Web Services. In his presentation, Werner described several of the challenges and two stuck very clearly in my mind. They resonated because at the time I was working in a different context on both of these problems. One was that relational databases don't scale. Um, my take on that is that the answer to this DB problem was to move to a genuinely distributed model for the system architecture overall. And that tends to lead us into the realms of event-based systems, asynchrony and eventual consistency. All stuff I was actively working on at the time. The other idea was that if this more complex model of systems is what we really need, then how do you structure development so that you can give developers insight into the correctness of their changes? At this time, I was partway through writing the continuous delivery book and so believed that I knew the answer to this too. At the end of his talk, Werner said, if you know any, how to do any of this, come and talk to me. <laughs> but I didn't because I was rather enjoying what I was working on at the time and there was a long queue of people waiting to speak to him, presumably about other aspects of his talk. But it looks like Amazon did okay anyway to me. Before we go any further, let me say thank you to our sponsors. We're fortunate to be sponsored by Equal Experts, Tricentis and Transfic. All of these companies offer products and services that are very well aligned with the topics that we discuss here on this channel every week. So if you're looking for excellence in continuous delivery and software engineering, please do click on the links in the description below and check them out. Amazon were fairly early adopters of continuous delivery as a general approach to software development. I recently came across a post by Amazon engineer Claire Liguri, who writes about some of the detail of how they organize their work. This isn't the team topologies part or the message-based event-driven microservice part. This is the basics of working so that your software is always releasable and keeping it there, continuous delivery. Claire describes the Amazon version of continuous delivery as comprising of four fundamental parts, source, build, test, and prod. My terminology is slightly different, but we are talking about exactly the same ideas. I describe a deployment pipeline as consisting of commit, acceptance, and production phases, and define the scope of the pipeline as evaluating an independently deployable unit of software. So I'd map Amazon stuff onto my model rather like this. Amazon lists the things they expect to be in the repository that the pipeline evaluates. 
These are the things that define a releasable unit of software. Everything is under version control together. So the version control defines the versions of all of these things that work and change together. This eliminates any problems of dependency management by making the scope of the stuff in a repo the stuff that defines a releasable unit of software. What Amazon calls build, I'd call the commit phase. The job of the commit phase is to give fast, accurate feedback to developers following any change. If all these tests pass, then the Amazon developer can move on to work on new things. At the end of the build or commit step, if all of the tests pass, they package and store the artifact. I call this creating the release candidate. But once again, despite differences in terminology, this is exactly how I define the job of the commit stage in continuous delivery. All of these things are strongly focused on delivering great, fast feedback on changes to the development team, and so supporting the fine-grained development process. There's no hiding change away on feature branches here, or the change management theater of Gitflow. Amazon practice trunk-based development and full-blown continuous integration all of the time. This maximizes visibility for the development teams into the true state of the system that they're working on at all times. The next phase in the deployment pipeline is what I call the acceptance phase, but what Amazon just call testing. Inevitably, I suppose, I like my words better, because there's testing in every phase. But the goals of and the fine-grained detail of the approach are still identical to the model that I recommend. The build or commit phase produced the artifact or release candidate as the result of all tests passing. And from now on, any further testing that we do, we'll be evaluating things at the release candidate level, rather than at the level of source code. So any more testing from now on starts by deploying the release candidate and then checking that it's up and running and ready for use Amazon refers to this part as health checks, which confirm that the system is ready before starting the tests. Here's the picture that I use in my training to describe what this process looks like. They're almost identical. I don't know if my work influenced Amazon, but I didn't get this from them. Um, so either they got it from me, or probably more likely, this is an example of convergent evolution. This approach works so well that when you apply a disciplined engineering approach to thinking about problems and solving them, and trying different things, keeping the things that really work and discarding the things that don't, then you tend to end up in the same place, even if you began from different starting positions. In science, this kind of thing is called reproducibility. And that is one of the strongest assertions of the correctness of your findings that there is. Again, there are some terminology differences, but the process is pretty much identical once again. If you'd like to learn more about this reproducible world-class approach to software development, by the way, check out my free introductory training course. There's a link to that in the description below. Amazon calls the next phase of testing integration testing. Jez and I called it acceptance testing. But the goal is the same. Our aim is to deploy the same bits and bytes that represent our release candidate into a production-like test environment and then to evaluate it in realistic lifelike scenarios. Or, as Amazon describe it, these tests exercise the full stack end-to-end -end by calling real APIs running on real infrastructure. Fundamentally, what's going on here is completely perfectly in line with the approach that we describe as continuous delivery. I describe this phase of the pipeline as evaluating the releasability of our changes. And the idea is that this evaluation is completely definitive. If the pipeline says pass, we're free to release the change into production with no further work to do. If it says fail, we're not and need to submit a new change to the pipeline to correct the mistake. What determines releasability for Amazon might be different to what determines it for you or me but they're doing exactly the same thing here as I do when I, when I form a project. For the high performance systems that I used to build, there's not enough about performance testing here. 
Amazon focuses more explicitly on testing observability than when we did building high performance systems. We bundled observability testing in with our regular acceptance testing. Presumably Amazon bundled performance testing into what they call load testing. But these are differences due to the nature of the differences in the business. The model of development is still identical. Amazon talk about one box testing, which is aimed at allowing teams to make progress independently of one another. Microservices call the production version of the API from services owned by other teams. But in the pipeline, they also just check the compatibility with the pre-production version of that, those dependent APIs too. So to be clear, Amazon microservices support multiple versions of all of their APIs as a mechanism to manage change between them, as I describe in this video. I'm not entirely clear how Amazon cope with the potential race conditions between teams in this approach to compatibility testing. That is, what happens if team A checks compatibility with team B's service, just as team B is moving the pre-prod API to being the prod API, for example. At this scale, there isn't going to be a single copy of the truth of the whole system anywhere other than in production. This isn't monolith a monolithic testing strategy. So that means there are multiple copies of collections of related services. If I understand this correctly, the way that Amazon cope with this is to accept that there's no perfect here and accept that for some things, they might discover problems later in the process, maybe even in production. So what they do is to optimize to be great at rolling back changes and to limit the blast radius of any failure that does actually make it into production. They accomplish this through sophisticated form of canary releasing, rolling out change progressively and having great observability on the assumption that if there is a problem, it will be found before the change is rolled out to everyone. This isn't the right answer for every kind of business, but it's exactly right for Amazon. I'd also assume that there are some other forms of contract testing somewhere in the picture of pre-release testing. At least, that's what I think I would do in their position to further reduce the chances of failures in production turning up, even if I was good at containing them and recovering from them. There's a lot more of really interesting detail in Claire's post, and I recommend that you check it out. There's a link to that in the description below too. And a lot, there's a lot to learn from it, but what I find really interesting is just how closely this tracks the model of continuous delivery that I present. I guess that I'm not really surprised by all of this, since I know that this stuff works better than anything else that we've found so far. But I think that the level of detail with which Amazon's model for continuous delivery tracks what I've done and what I describe on this channel is an important independent verification and validation of this model of world-class software development. Thank you. Over on Patreon, we host a regular Q&A show where you can send me specific questions and I answer them in a pre-recorded session once per month. Right now, we're hosting a competition for our members where you can win the chance to host the Q&A show where you can ask me the questions submitted by members, as well as throwing in as many as you like of your own. If that's something that you're interested in, then enter the competition by becoming a supporter on Patreon. If you're not already, there's a seven day free trial available. Uh, once you are a member, submit a question on our Discord server for the next Q&A show. That's it. The deadline for entry will be the 31st of August this year, 23. So good luck to you.